Excellencies, Honourable Minister, uh, Stockholm Water Prize laureates, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start, um, I've been asked to make a special announcement on behalf of the uh, World Food Prize organisation. On this day, there is uh, yet another special honour being accorded to the International Water Management Institute. The World Food Prize Foundation in the United States has asked me to announce that its new Norman Borlaug Award for Field Research and Application, endowed by the Rockefeller Foundation for individuals under the age of 40, is being presented to a member of IMI staff. This is Dr. Aditi Mukherjee, who's with us in the audience. I Aditi is a young uh, Indian scientist whose research on groundwater resources in West Bengal has led to significant policy changes that have benefited thousands of farmers, and she'll receive the award in Des Moines in Iowa on October the 17th. I want to uh, talk today, as, as Jens said, about uh, what I would call the food and water paradox. We really are faced with the issue of feeding approximately two billion or more people, in my belief, with less water for agriculture than we have now, and in an era of climate change. This is going to be one of the most significant challenges for humankind over the next 20 or 30 years. However, I think it is a challenge that we will rise to and deal with as long as we are aware of it. And there are two critical drivers that are, are really coming to the fore uh, in terms of the, the need for more food production. These are the growing population, which we all know about, but also the impact of growing wealth. What I want to do in this talk is uh, look at this paradox and illustrate how some of Imi's work has contributed to sort of highlighting some of the issues and how hopefully it will contribute to delivering very successful outcomes in terms of the challenges ahead. I mentioned uh, a moment ago the, the fact that we have uh, growing, growing GDP. Whilst population has increased about 3.6 times, water withdrawals have increased about uh, 6.8 times uh, in this period from 19, uh, 1900 to the current day, but GDP has increased on average about 19 times, at about 3% per year. And this is a very major driver of demand for, uh, for food, for, uh, for goods, uh, and for services. And it's uh, very critical in terms of uh, the impact that this will have on water. And I will come back to that a little bit later. In terms of uh, population and population growth, we also are looking as GDP increases at dietary change, uh, and that is going to create uh, demand for more food, uh, uh, more water intense foods, uh, particularly meats uh, and animal proteins. And we also see that uh, there are some geographic uh, areas of focus which we need to look at, particularly South Asia, where population of poor is very, still very high, uh, also to some extent East Asia, but also as we can see from that map, uh, a significant proportion of Sub-Saharan Africa. And we'll see in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, potential population growth of about 98% uh, by 2050, whereas in Asia we're already seeing population growth uh, slowing, slowing right down. The, the drivers uh, of food security and water scarcity, in my view, paint quite a pessimistic picture even before we consider climate change. <clears throat> At the food, the food summit uh, in Rome a few years ago, uh, we see this oft-quoted figure of uh, the fact that we've got to increase food production by 70% by 2050. Uh, the comprehensive assessment, which was a, a joint exercise of many scientists around the world, uh, led by David Molden from IMI, uh, show that if we continued to follow a business-as-usual approach with current levels of productivity, we're going to need up to 6,000 cubic kilometres more water withdrawals 
Uh, and the real question is, where is that going to come from? We probably just don't have access to that amount of unused, fresh water. And if we consider looking at oceans, the cost in terms of energy and desalination uh, to grow food are phenomenal. And we're seeing evidence being presented today by many agencies uh, that uh, climate change may reduce yields in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia by 30%. Uh, due to increasing night temperatures uh, and a whole range of uh, issues associated with uh, plant floristics. Uh, in, the, in the US, we've seen predictions of 30 to 46 percent there with corn and soybeans and cotton. And we're all see, all already seeing this year uh, evidence of uh, severe drought in the US and elsewhere, uh, which may be uh, indicative of the greater climate variability that we're going to face in the future. So we're, we're looking at uh, a number of very significant issues in terms of population growth, dietary change, uh, not to mention the competition for water for biofuels, and then on top of that climate change, making it extremely uh, difficult in terms of uh, uh, looking at how we're going to produce this total amount of food. The Green Revolution uh, was, was fueled and, as was said earlier, uh, delivered uh, against many of the challenges in the 60s and 70s of food production. It was fueled by fertiliser and irrigation, but it came at quite a cost. Uh, we have the World Bank uh, lending for irrigation in, in Orange, and that uh, peaked in the uh, 60s and 70s. But we can see the uh, total area of irrigation in the green bars. Uh, continue to increase. That's largely due to private uh, smallholder schemes, in, uh, in particularly in South Asia. Uh, sorry, the World Bank lending is in the green, and the, world, and the food price index is in the orange. And we're seeing now the trend of uh, potentially upward uh, increases in food, food prices once again following the 2007-2008 uh, food crisis. The irrigated area uh, continued to increase uh, because of this uh, growth of smallholder irrigation. Uh, and yet we've seen uh, things like the uh, Living Planet Freshwater Species Index declining as more and more water gets withdrawn. So we have coped, but we've coped so far at a cost. Some of Imi's work, which has uh, helped get us to the sort of uh, current understanding, uh, is focused around uh, river basins, and Imi has stressed that uh, irrigation needs to be considered not just at the irrigation site, but in the context of the river basin, and in terms of what is happening to water allocations and water use across the entire basin, uh, and how other competing water uses and users are impacted by agriculture, and vice versa. Um, this is really built on the strength of the IWRM approach that has been emerging for decades. And what was shown uh, from some of this work that a number of basins were closing due to over-extraction of water. The Murray-Darling, the Colorado, the Krishna in India are some well-known examples. And from that we've uh, developed their uh, water stress indicator uh, where, which shows areas in red where environmental water requirements may not be met under current usage. The next uh, key sort of focus of Emmy's work was really focused around water accounting. If we want to uh, provide good sound evidence about how to use water to best advantage, we need to, to measure it. You can't manage it if you can't measure it, as the old adage goes. And uh, this was some early work uh, uh, from David Molden that looked at uh, how we could apportion water uses, uh, water extraction uh, in basins, and then understand uh, how much water we had to play with. Not only just the blue water, but also this approach has been adapted to include the green water, the rain which falls on the soil and is stored in the soil, and then is used by the crop. And then this work then led on to this uh, relatively often used diagram of uh, water scarcity, uh, which demonstrated that by 2000, uh, the areas in uh, the orangey uh, tones uh, were physically water scarce, uh, defined by 
approximately 75% of the available water resources already being used, but also pointed out that there were significant areas around the world where there was economic water scarcity. And this is essentially uh, focused there in large parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, in areas where there just has not been enough investment to get water to where it's needed, both in terms of agriculture, but also in terms of drinking water and industrial water. Uh, so another challenge in terms of investment, not just, not just physical scarcity. And from those approaches, uh, the comprehensive assessment was able to demonstrate uh, that uh, if we continued to move towards growing the required amount of food for the 70% uh, the 70 more food required by the growing population, that we were going to have to follow the, the bottom brown bar there, which shows that uh, water extraction from 2000 to 2050 uh, approximately uh, is going to double. And as I said earlier, that's uh, highly unlikely. However, when we started looking at some of these simple solutions that could be put in place uh, in terms of improving productivity, a more crop per drop, uh, increasing irrigation, emphasizing the need for more trade in food, uh, and so on, we can certainly come up with figures which mean that we can produce the required amount of food with significantly less water than uh, the doubling predicted under a business as usual case. That leads us to sort of approximately where we are today and I need now to sort of dwell and look a little bit more on some of the, uh, the potential um, solutions that uh, we may have. But I want to do that in the context of uh, uh, some information there presented after Peter Gleek which uh, has shown people's predictions over the last uh, 30 or so years in terms of uh, the actual demand that there will be uh, for water withdrawals. The black line is the line with historical global water withdrawals uh, on it, which is the actual. Uh, and then pre-1980, people were predicting very, very high rates of extraction. But as we've moved forward into the current uh, century, uh, with better understanding of technology and what is possible and productivity increases, uh, we are starting to sort of pull those predictions back to some extent. However, I think the situation is still quite dire. This is some new modelling work that myself and a colleague have been doing under the auspices of the, uh, the Golbenkian Foundation. And uh, what we show there is uh, one scenario that we've been modelling, which is an optimistic scenario. This is a scenario where population growth around the world slows uh, to a, a, a lower rate than the sort of uh, the median predicted by the UN, but GDP continues to increase. So there are fewer people who are relatively better, better off financially. Uh, which in, in turn creates quite a strong demand for water. And we see under that scenario that as we move into the uh, future years, industrial demand and domestic demand increases very dramatically, uh, whereas the amount of demand for food and agriculture uh, is, and consumption by food and agriculture is only increasing uh, relatively slowly as can be seen. I put on there the approximate year 2,000 water withdrawals at 4,000 cubic kilometres, which Peter Gleek showed, and uh, we can see that uh, consumption, consumptive demand in the future will be greater than uh, what are likely going to be the available water withdrawals. This is doubly important because uh, consu consumption requires uh, an error of margin, more water than... Uh, than just for consumption uh, to actually produce that amount of food. So it demonstrates that by about 2030 to 40, uh, in many areas, and of course these are averages, uh, we've done this for a whole range of catchments and areas, in many areas we're going to be very much uh, facing uh, the fact that we have no more water to, uh, to use uh, to produce food and for other purposes. And on top of that, we've looked at climate change and what are the impacts of that. 
And I won't go into details there other than to say that on, we have a global rainfall diagram under, under a couple of the IPCC climate change models, which show there's an awful lot of variability in the rainfall and there's no clear trend. And that, that's being replicated by a number of researchers around the world. But what we are showing there, and this again I think is being replicated elsewhere, is that uh, potential evapotranspiration is increasing under the gradually increasing temperature scenarios that we're seeing in the climate change models. And this for, is, for, is very, very significant for agriculture. Uh, and we've done a calculation in all the irrigated areas of the world that uh, the increasing evapotranspiration will increase demand for irrigation water to maintain productivity levels between 14 and 17 percent higher. And I think this is a pretty important and significant finding uh, and something that shows how we were going to have to adapt uh, to these climate change impacts as well as all the other pressures in terms of population and water demand. So in terms of a few concluding s slides, we have a paradox, as I mentioned earlier on. We are getting, going to have increasing competition from water, for water from urban and industrial users. Irriga agriculture may have to main, make do on what it receives now, both in the rain-fed environments and in the uh, irrigated environments. So how are we going to produce that 70% more food that is, that is needed to maintain a uh, decent standard of living for everybody? One thing we can do is to improve irrigation efficiency and water productivity, as I mentioned. We can build resilience in terms of storage of water. Uh, the minister from Egypt mentioned the average in Africa is only a 100 cubic metres, 100 cubic metres of water stored per person. Uh, in Australia, where I come from, it's nearly 5,000 cubic metres per person. And we found that figure wanting in uh, periods of significant drought. drought. So building resilience in terms of storage is important. A greater focus on recycling and reuse of water is going to be important. As the speaker from PepsiCo mentioned, uh, industry becoming more and more efficient in its use and recycling water and becoming water positive, as he mentioned. Uh, it's all got to be done in the, uh, the light of water reforms, policy changes, governance, institutional change and regulation. And as was mentioned earlier, critical issue of reducing food waste uh, can help us in a very significant manner reduce the demand for water. And I think also a critical area is looking at uh, making sure we can uh, not waste production by having efficient supply chains which link smallholder farmers through to markets uh, everywhere around the world, not just in the Western world. And some of this is going on. That's a rather squiggly diagram uh, produced by one of my colleagues, but it shows the vertical lines show basically what is water productivity increase, i.e. more crop per drop, without any increase in land area. The blue line, and these are for a number of years, so the squiggliness is a climate impact. The blue line shows uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is increasing productivity, but by increasing the area of land. That is possible, but we also need to see Sub-Saharan Africa moving up the vertical uh, as that land gets scarcer and making more use of the water, not just expanding laterally. We need to engage people uh, increasingly in terms of uh, how they are empowered and how they manage their water. IMI was very much involved in participatory irrigation management in its early days. And uh, this is actually some work um, that uh, Aditi Mukherjee, who I mentioned a while back, uh, has done, which shows that uh, participatory irrigation management is not always the success it's made out to be. There are many schemes in Asia which have actually failed for various reasons. Many successes, but many failures, often due to the fact that the people who instigated them or the governance or NGOs who supported them financially and with technical capacity pulled out and then the scheme collapsed. Whereas in the schemes that do continue and succeed, they are a pathway to very much greater productivity uh, in terms of the way we need productivity to increase. Wastewater reuse, uh, that's a map, uh, you won't be able to read those, of a number of countries around the world 
uh, showing how much water is recycled uh, due to water pollution or water scarcity uh, issues. At the moment, we're having highlighted the potential in this area, we're moving into looking at uh, how can we actually start to produce business models which can encourage people to go into business in, in wastewater recycling and make money out of it and at the same time recycle the water and the nutrients back as fertiliser into the system. Uh, this is a very uh, fertile area uh, but a very difficult area and one which uh, is currently sort of under potential inve in investigation for its potential. I think the secret to all of this, this challenge and this paradox is really looking at how can we sustainably intensify agriculture. And this is going to be a challenge for all of us in every country across the globe if we are going to feed ourselves successfully and if we're going to use less water to do that and also have less impact on the environment and other water users. And there are a number of issues which cut across scales here. Closing the actual versus potential yield gap, there's great potential here in many countries on many farms. It's an on-farm issue which rely, rely on a lot of capacity building and knowledge. Growing twice the yield of half the area, going up that uh, vertical rather than across the horizontal uh, is going to be a major, major challenge which will be doable in many countries. Capitalising on natural infrastructure using aquifers for recharging floodwaters and then reusing that water for agriculture in droughts and in the dry season, so two crops can be achieved. Recognising the value of ecosystem services. The, these are not just uh, the fresh drinking water downstream, but they're things like pollination services, soil formation services, and so on. And we we actually live for far too long off the capital without replenishing uh, many of these uh, services. We have to recognise these and we have to make sure our agriculture is in harmony with the environment so we can continue to benefit from these vital services. And then looking at uh, uh, this critical issue between energy and food and water and environment, which is often uh, crossing or transcendent of uh, national boundaries. What does sustainable intensification mean? Uh, it means a lot of things to many people, but I think uh, some of the critical things are minimal off-site movement of pollutants, maintaining downstream flows and water quality, utilising natural infrastructure for storage and flood pre prevention, maintaining habitat, sequestering carbon, not only for, to mitigate climate change impacts, but also to improve soil fertility, soil water holding ability, and so on and maximising energy consumption at all stages. Uh, uh, sorry, that should read optimising. Uh, so that's right, maximising energy efficiency and minimising water consumption at all stages in the agricultural cycle. <coughs> there obviously will be some areas uh, where it's going to be important to put focus on. Initially, these are just some examples. There are many others. McKinsey... Uh, the Water Resources 2030 group pointed out that uh, in India, demand is going to exceed supply by about 2030. And that was using data from ME, IFPRI and the Indian government. And again, they pointed out there are a number of uh, relatively simple solutions that can be implemented to deal with that issue so that India won't actually run, <coughs> run dry in that sense. In other countries, and there's just one example here, I'm not picking on Pakistan, land tenure systems and water access systems are, uh, are particularly difficult. They need significant reform. <coughs> Pakistan has a very high population growth rate and it's going to have some major problems in terms of food security in the future, in, in my belief. <coughs> and also, we're just starting to see yields increase in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, whereas they have stagnated for many years. Uh, that's going to be a big, big challenge in, in that, that environment. So to come to a few conclusions, I think that uh, the paradox I talked about earlier is a, a daunting paradox in that we, we are going to have to grow more, much more food on approximately the same amount of water or potentially even less water than we have now in the context of increasing demand, uh, 
for water, for food, and the impacts of climate change. These issues are going to be particularly hard and difficult in the developing world, largely because that's where population increase is, in, is growing rapidly, and also that's where GDP is going to grow uh, rapidly as countries become wealthier. Business as usual paradigms that we've uh, we sort of developed uh, and we build on the successes of the uh, Green Revolution, uh, we have to now look again and see what, what needs to change, how we can become more productive, and we can't rely on what we did 20 or 30 years ago. And I think that uh, this focus on sustainable intensification is the way forward, but it's going to require significant investment in R&D, and not only R&D, but capacity building, and in the land and water reforms, the governance issues which are so critical to helping us achieve uh, increased productivity in a sustainable manner. So in conclusion, if we combine these uh, approaches with the reduction of food waste, which I think the figure I have in my mind is about 1.1300 1, uh, cubic kilometres of water are the amount of water that is wasted uh, as the head the director general of FAO told us, in this food which doesn't get to market or is thrown out of our refrigerators. That's a very significant amount of the water for food production. So we've got, we've got to save that and we've got to combine a whole range of other approaches without significantly increasing agriculture's footprint. Thank you very much.